Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking about the James Webb Space Telescope with Dr. Amber Strawn from Goddard Space Flight Center at NASA. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with me, Dr. Kiki Sanford, episode number 105, recorded on Thursday, July 21st, 2011. Next in line. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com forward slash twit. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Dr. Kiki Science Hour. I'm Dr. Kiki Sanford. This is episode 105, and today we are going to be going to what well, we're looking at, outer space, hopefully. Fingers crossed on this one, everyone. So I hope you're ready to get dig in to the science of the James Webb Space Telescope. And... Uh, the la this last week, the James Webb Space Telescope uh, has been under scrutiny by members of the House Appropriations Subcommittee, and a version of the Appropriations Bill has been passed by that subcommittee that cuts the funding to the James Webb Space Telescope. So the question now is, should funding be continued, and if so, why? And what is planned for the James Webb Space Telescope that will add significantly to our understanding of the universe? I hope to, under, to uh, discuss this important question today with our guest, Dr. Amber Strawn. She is the lead scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope Education and Public Outreach at NASA's Goddard's Space Flight Center. But first, before we dig into our main subject, of course, we have our science headlines. So let's get started. NASA's space shuttle Atlantis landed safely this morning at Kennedy Space Center, marking the end of the shuttle program and the beginning of a new chapter for human space exploration. NASA's probe Dawn is finally in orbit around the asteroid Vesta in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Dawn arrived at Vesta late last week after being propelled by ion thrusters over 1.7 billion miles in four years. Scientists hope to gather information about solar system formation by looking at one of the oldest surfaces in our solar system. According to a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, most of the oil from the Deepwater Horizon spill never actually made it to the surface because it was dissolved in and dispersed by the, uh, by the Gulf's currents. Sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, Sometimes discoveries are made as a result of good accidents. A researcher at Tufts University left the video camera on all night to record some developing frog embryos. He discovered bioelectrical flashes that occurred just prior to the formation of the features of the frog face. The electrical activity is the result of ion movement and predicted the eyes, nose, mouth, and other facial, facial features locations. Most people like to grow teeth in their mouths, right? Well, Japanese researchers succeeded in growing a tooth in where? A mouse kidney, of course. The technique is significantly faster than other regeneration methods, shaving off about 10, ta 10 days from total regeneration time. And I don't think I need to say anything else about this one. Finally, NASA's Hubble spotted a fourth moon orbiting Pluto in addition to Charon, Hydra, and Nix. My question here is, how many moons does a body have to have to actually be considered a planet? Anyway, that's the news for this week. Finally, we get to get in to our main topic of the hour, the James Webb Space Telescope. Once again, our guest, Dr. Amber Strawn, is a research astrophysicist in the Observational Cosmology Laboratory at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. She serves as the lead scientist for James Webb Space Telescope Education and Public Outreach. 
Her broad research interests include galaxy formation and evolution, galaxy mergers and interactions, physical processes induced by galaxy interactions, including star formation and black hole growth. And additionally, she has most recently been working on infrared spectroscopic data from the new Wide Field Camera 3 on Hubble's Space Telescope. Welcome, Amber. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. I. I'm really excited to be able to get you on. I, uh, I noticed in your bio and also part of your title that you are really involved in outreach and public education. How did you get so involved in that aspect of, of science? Well, I mean, m most of the time I'm doing research. So I'm sitting in my computer actually studying galaxies, which is really cool. But I, I kind of feel like it's a duty of scientists to uh, explain what we're doing to the public. After all, a lot of, of what we do is funded by the public, by American taxpayers. And so I really take that duty seriously. And I think um, getting the message of science out there to, um, to students and to the public is um, what kind of fuels the next generation of explorers for NASA. So I think it's really important. And in your personal story of getting into science and becoming interested in astrophysics, how did how did all that get started? Well, I I have maybe what is a typical astronomer story. So I grew up um, in Arkansas on a small farm. Uh, it was a kind of stereotypical small southern farm. We had uh, grew our own food, and we had cows and pigs and and uh, but it was small it was a tiny little rural town in north central arkansas and uh... part of being in a small town far away from any big cities is that the skies were absolutely gorgeous at night so i would go outside even as a very little kid and just stare at the stars and wonder what was out there and wonder how it all worked so from a very young age i really uh... developed this passion for astronomy and for questioning and and uh... How, what's up there how do we get here why are things the way they are so i really kind of credit growing up in a small town like that to getting my start in astronomy. And then all along the way, I've, I've had um, lots of interactions uh, with, with NASA and um, the, the Hubble Space Telescope is a big part of that. The shuttle program, which of course today was a historic event, the last uh, landing of, of, of shuttle Atlantis. Um, but all along the way, NASA has been a source of inspiration for me personally, and I think it uh, continues to be that today. But um, I got my start with NASA programs as an undergraduate. I was on a team of four undergrads, and we got to fly an experiment on NASA's zero-gravity plane. So that was my first official NASA exper experience. The vomit comet, right? The vomit comet. And <laughs> I love it. So uh, I, I made it okay. I actually loved it. I had a blast. It was so much fun. So that was my first kind of official NASA experience, and it was awesome. I was hooked. Uh, and so um, I went on from there, uh, graduated uh, from University of Arkansas um, with my degree in physics. I went on to Arizona State to, to um, do my graduate study. And as part of that, I was involved in a NASA space grant program. I had a three-year um, graduate fellowship program, the Jenkins Fellowship, which is aimed at women and minorities in, in the STEM disciplines. And then I had a NASA um, postdoc uh, fellowship for a few years before I um, kind of started on permanently here at NASA. So all along the way, NASA has been uh, very integral to my um, becoming an astronomer. Do you think NASA is, uh, and, and the projects like Hubble, Spitzer Space Telescope, the uh, James Webb Space Telescope, do you think the big projects that NASA is able to fund and develop, uh, that it, it plays a role in um, fostering new generations of scientists and astrophysicists? Absolutely. I think it plays a huge role. And um, for me personally, I know that was a big part of it, but, um, you know, Hubble has become this cultural icon. Everybody knows Hubble, um, and and the the images are beautiful. They're all over the place. They're um, you know they're in in libraries and museums, and and everybody is just has this familiar connection with Hubble and with the other awesome space telescopes that NASA has sent up. So um, I do think that that these uh, these big space missions, which are probing the frontiers of science, are uh, crucial to getting kids involved and interested and excited about science and about the future of, of space, um, space science, space exploration, all the big cool NASA things that NASA does. So to, let's start digging into the actual, the actual projects. So the James Webb Space Telescope is supposed to be the successor to Hubble and the Spitzer Telescope. Um, what will the James Webb Telescope do that, uh, that will build on 
what the other telescopes do now and, and you know, when they're decommissioned, what they won't be doing any longer. Right, so um, we have kind of come to the, the boundaries of what Hubble can see and do, and Spitzer for, the, for that matter. Um, I, and, you know, I love Hubble. Almost all of my uh, research that I've done has been using data from Hubble, and so I'm, I'm the biggest Hubble fan you will ever find. Uh, but of course, the space shuttle era is now over officially as of today, at least the flights. And um, so we can't go back to service Hubble. Um, it, we're we're going to keep using it as long as we can, uh, as long as the instrument, instruments still continue to work, and as long as there's funding, we'll continue to use Hubble. Uh, but you know, at some point, Hubble's mission will definitely end. And that's where we're starting to look ahead to the future and see what uh, what our next our next big plans are. And those next big plans are the James Webb Space Telescope. Okay. For the for the James Webb Space Telescope, it how long has it actually been in development? It's uh it, currently it's supposed to be launched in 2018. Am I correct about that? Right. NASA's working towards a 2018 launch. Okay. And how how long has it so that's only a few years away, but how long has it been in development and um, you know, what kind of challenges has it had to overcome technologically so far? Well, these these big bold NASA projects like the James Webb Space Telescope and like Hubble before it um, are, are are long long plans. So Hubble was had many many years of development. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, um, the first kind of solid ideas about it started really just a few years after Hubble was launched. So kind of the big 90s, people started to really think seriously about what we were going to do after Hubble, and um, so lots of years of development. Um, um, and ideas about about what's going to be next. So um, it's been in development a long time. Um, we've actually come very far on building the telescope. So uh, right now, about actually 75% of the mass of the telescope um, has already been built or is in production and testing. So we are, are really a long way along on, on the building of the actual hardware of the telescopes. We, uh, we had a crucial milestone uh, just a couple of weeks ago um, as of as of now, all of the primary mirrors have completed their polishing. So our primary mirror is um, basically done. The polishing, the hard part, is one of the most crucial technological milestones is um, is finished. So we've really come a long way. It's been many, many years in development. And again, these big projects like this are hard to do, and that's why NASA does them. And uh, we had to, to face several um, big technological hurdles. There are actually 10 brand new technologies that we had to develop for the Webb Telescope. Um, an example, one of them, uh, one of the instruments has micro shutters, which are smaller than the width of a human hair. So these tiny little shutters that are going to be able to open up and let us um, see spectra of distant galaxies and, and all these other things we want to look at in the universe. Um, also, the, the telescope itself is, is huge. Um, it's very big. Hubble's uh, primary mirror is about two and a half meters in diameter. Hubble itself is about the size of a school bus. Uh, the Webb telescope is, is much bigger. Its, its primary mirror is about seven times the light collecting area as Hubble. It has this huge yeah. sun shield that's the size of a tennis court. So Hubble's kind of the size of a school bus. The Webb telescope's about the size of a 747 in comparison. Mm. So um, it's big and because it's so big, we don't have any rockets that are big enough to launch it fully deployed. So we had to build this telescope so that it can be folded up like origami, put into a rocket, and then it unfolds like a transformer in space once it's launched. So um, just that, the whole deployable optics, um, building these huge sun shields, uh, all of these are, are, were big technological um, challenges, but uh, the telescope is, is well on its way of meeting all those technological challenges, and um, it's going to be just an amazing instrument, and we're really excited about it. It sounds like it's just going to, it, it sounds phenomenal, like it's the, the kind of instrument uh, that that scientists dream of being involved in building. Um, in terms of this, the science that's going to be happening, um, the mirrors. You said the mirrors are are complete. Um, they're, they've been polished uh, and are ready to go. Why do they have to be so big? And why do they have to be perfectly polished? And and what will that allow them to see? 
So all of the technology of the Webb Telescope is completely driven by the science. And this is actually a really cool process that most people maybe don't know about. Um, every 10 years, NASA asks the astronomers, the astronomical community, what are the biggest science questions that you want to answer? And uh, so every 10 years, astronomers get together and think about um, what the big science questions are. And these are called decadal surveys. And mm -hmm. so in uh, 2000, the um, astro astronomical community came up with this idea of a next generation space telescope, which became the James Webb Space Telescope. So we had these critical science questions that we wanted to answer. And in order to answer these questions, we needed a telescope that um, kind of had uh, a few main components. First of all, it needed to be big. So um, the amount of light you can collect from distant objects or from faint objects depends critically on the size of your mirror. So that's why um, the mirror has to be so big. Also, the sharpness of the images you see. So, uh, one of the great things about Hubble is, is some of the images we see of distant galaxies are just uh, very sharp, crisp. You can see lots of detail of these distant galaxies. And, um, and that is completely driven by how big the mirror is and also the wavelength that you're looking at. So, we needed a big mirror, a big telescope to answer these big science questions. So, it had to be big. Another <laughs> thing, um, a key difference between the Webb and Hubble, for example, example, um, is that it is an infrared telescope. It will see the universe in infrared light. And again, this is completely driven by the science. So, um, for example, uh, we want to see the very first stars and galaxies to form in the very early universe. With Hubble, we can only see back so far because light from distant galaxies has been, um, it's redder. Uh, it's been red shifted. And so, um, when we start thinking about, about that, um, you look at images of uh, deep images that Hubble has taken and you look at the most distant galaxies you can see in those images and they're all red so that gives us a clue if we want to see more distant we need to see more red and more red <laughs> means infrared light and um, and also another key science uh, uh, that we want to learn from the web is uh, to see how stars are born. And we know that stars are born inside dusty clouds. Well, you can't see through dust with optical light, the kind of light that Hubble sees. And uh, so we, in order to peer through those dust clouds and see the stars being born, we need to look in infrared light. So all of the science drivers for the mission um, are, are our um, demand that we have a, an infrared telescope. Now, infrared light is interesting because um, it's really hard to detect a lot of the infrared uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum from the ground. So we need a space telescope in order to observe these kind of um, uh, astronomical phenomenon that we want to see. So it has to be big, it has to be infrared, and it has to be in space has to be in space again so we can see that infrared light and also because it has to remain it has to be very cold the telescope itself the mirrors the detectors all have to be cold because infrared light you can kind of think of it like heat radiation so um, all the distant uh, signals that we hope to see um, are the, the detectors themselves have to stay very, very cold so we can see these faint infrared systems, um, infrared signals. And so because of that, we have to launch the telescope out to deep space. So it's big, it's infrared, it's in space, and it's cold. All right. For the, uh, for the, 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 the big factor, you mentioned origami. You mentioned the folding of it and the, uh, this tennis, si tennis court sized sun shield is going to be folded into in how how have you determined the shape for the folding and the unfurling and and what kind of uh, of, of developments have had to be necessary for for that concept well, we've had a lot of engineers working on these things for many years, and uh, we've uh, Northrop Grumman is our prime contractor, and they are the world's experts at deployable optics and these deployable systems. And so um, they're they're um, the prime contractor for the telescope, and uh, yeah, so because it's so big, it does have to fold up. And um, we have a really cool deployment sequence um, on our website jwst.nasa.gov that you'll be able to see um, later on um, of how the telescope itself actually unfolds. So it, it basically the sun shield, which is, you know, big, uh, 
uh, folds up and kind of makes a, a shroud around um, the, the folded up optics. So the mirrors fold up, um, the secondary mirror folds up, the sun shield folds up around it, and then it's put into a rocket. So at this point, it's kind of cylindrical shaped. And it's going to be launched um, in an Ariane 5 rocket from South America, French Guiana. And then on its way to space, it will unfold, unfurl. And um, that whole process um, will take many, many days um, on, its, on its way out to space. Now, um, another key difference between Webb and Hubble is that Hubble orbits the Earth about 350 miles up. So um, in, in, in an astronomical sense, it's relatively nearby, right? We can get to it with the shuttle, and we have. We've been back to serve as Hubble five times. Um, but again, because the Webb telescope is infrared, it has to remain very cold. Um, 350 miles up, not really really that cold, so we need to get further out in space so that the telescope itself will, will remain very cold. And so we're going to a point in space called L2, the second Lagrange point, uh, which is a, a fancy name for a, a point in space in the Earth-Sun gravity system that is stable. So this point is about a million miles from Earth. It's about four times further away than the moon, and out there it's very cold. It's a good place to put an infrared observatory. And so on uh, the Webb's long trip out to L2, it'll take about three months or so to get out there. And once it's out there, it will be able to cool down. And it's during that trip that the deployment sequence will take place. Okay. And um, the so is it it's going to be unfurling and it's going to be basically assembling itself on its way to that Lagrange point. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So. So over the course of the of the of transit, is there any concern about um, about objects that it might come in contact with? Is there anything that could potentially damage it on the on as it's unfurling and getting to where it's supposed to be? Well, of course. That most of um, the trip between here and there will be empty space, so we're right. not really worried um, so much about that. Um, there have been teams that have just um, kind of studied the the effect of micrometeorites, and so we've, mm -hmm. we've thought about that, and um, we we know that the sun shields, for example, can handle you know a few little micrometeorites here and there. Um, of course, if something big happens to come through and hit us, you know, that would, that would be bad. Uh, but we don't anticipate that happening. Space is big. Uh, NASA currently has a couple of satellites out in that part of space. And so it's a place that we know how to get to. And um, it's, it's a good place, again, for an infrared observatory. Okay. I noticed that one of the other innovations that has been developed for the James Webb telescope is a cryo cooler. If it's going to, um, you know, outer going to space to be in the cool environment of space it's got the sunshade to keep it from being heated too much by the by the the light of the sun um, why have a cryo cooler in addition to all of that so the telescope itself um, it has four instruments and um, three of the instruments work primarily in the near infrared so kind of just a little bit redder than what your eyes can see and mm -hmm. um, those those instruments and uh, most of the observatory itself is what it will be uh, what we call passively cooled so the coldness of space will be cold enough for that um, so those detectors uh, just being in that part of space will be cold enough for them to make their detections now we also have a mid infrared instrument instrument that will observe um, light in the mid-infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So that, those are wavelengths that are a little bit uh, redder than the near-infrared. And um, because they um, are, are further out in the spectrum, that instrument itself needs to be um, cryocooled. So the whole observatory is going to be about somewhere around 40, um, 40 degrees uh, above absolute zero, about 400 uh, degrees below zero Fahrenheit, so very, very mm -hmm. cold. Uh, but that one instrument does need to remain, um, be, be cooled a little bit. And so that's why uh, we have a, cr uh, a cooler for that instrument. What's the, is there a power source for the, for the cryo cooling or is that? Um, well, well the, the observatory itself um, has, well, it has a uh, solar array to power mm -hmm. the electronics and everything. And um, the, uh, we also are, are carrying fuel, so we have a couple of different sources of power. Um, the fuel is primarily used for um, for keeping uh, the observatory in its orbit, so it's actually not going to be stationary at L2. It will kind of orbit around L2. 
Okay, so it's not it's not going to stay in one location. If that's um, if it's moving, how are you able to focus on any one point in outer space from where you are? Well, um, again, that's kind of what the fuel, why we have the fuel there. So we can, we can do those um, little movements and, and the adjustments. And um, we, we um, again, have a lot of people working on to make sure that our pointing will be good. This is actually one of the big challenges, um, uh, or big technological challenges for a telescope like this, is to um, get it to where we can point it at a million miles away. But uh, we're confident that we'll be able to do it and excited about what it will see. How much of a uh, of a delay will there be in communication between the Earth and the space telescope so that when you are actually uh, doing observations, taking measurements, um, using the scientific instruments on the telescope and trying to control the, the scope, um, you know how much of how much of a challenge is that going to be? Well, the um, the actual kind of operation side of the telescope will proceed uh, much like Hubble. And mm -hmm. so, um, there, uh, so the, the Hubble is operated from the Space Telescope Science Institute, um, a few miles up the road from here in Baltimore, and um, they they deal with all the the operations. So the actual data from Hubble, and this will be very similar for uh, for Webb, um, has a kind of a long path. So it's you know the data from Hubble is sent to different orbiting um, satellites and then down to the ground and then it goes through Goddard and then it goes to the Institute. So it kind of has a long path um, to get to the, um, the actual uh, operations center up at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And then it goes through um, data processing, data um, pipelines so that, that it's ready for the astronomers to use. And then from there it goes to the actual astronomers. So this whole, the whole process of um, well, how do I get data from Hubble, or how will I get data from from Webb? Um, if you're an astronomer, it's a it's a competitive process. So um, you actually write proposals and say, "This is my awesome science idea. This is the cool right. things I want to observe." And so um, that that's how we get time with Hubble. And then the actual um, process of of scheduling and getting the data back um, is, is is takes a lot of time. Takes a lot of time. Um, I have to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. And uh, after that, we'll come back for more questions and, and more discussion of what's going on with the science of the James Webb Space Telescope. So stay with me, everyone, while, we're, while, we're, while we go to our break. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of movies and TV episodes directly to you instantly, which means that you save time, money, and hassle. There are several very easy ways to instantly access streaming movies and television shows with Netflix. First, you can watch Netflix movies and TV shows on your Mac, PC, or iPad. There is an iPad app that you might like. You can watch on your iPhone and some Android phones as well. If you have a gaming console, an Xbox 360, PS3, Nintendo Wii, you can watch Netflix right on your TV. And if you're not a gamer, you can watch Netflix on your TV with an Apple TV box or a Roku box. With Netflix, you can watch movies and TV shows instantly using any of these devices. And you can start watching a movie or TV show on any one of the devices, stop watching it, and then continue watching it from where you left off on another device, so you never lose time trying to figure out where you were or what you were watching before. Whichever way you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many movies and TV shows as you want any time you want, and you can cancel at any time. But if you want to try them out, you want to give Netflix a try, you can try them today for 30 days for absolutely free. Go to netflix.com forward slash twit. That's netflix, N-E-T-F-L-I-X dot com forward slash T-W-I-T. Be sure to use this URL when you sign up for your free trial at netflix.com forward slash twit. We thank Netflix for their support of twit and Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, and we hope you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. Now back to the show, we're discussing the James Webb Space Telescope, finding out what science this telescope is meant to do and why the science that it is supposed to do is so important in helping us 
understand the universe. I'm talking with Dr. Amber Strawn from NASA's Goddard State Space Flight Center. Amber, can you uh, talk a little bit, you just spoke earlier very briefly about these micro shutters. Can you talk a little bit more about them and how, um, how they'll enable fine control over uh, the imaging system? Sure. So the um, micro shutters are a part of one of our main science instruments called near spec or near infrared spectrometer. And uh, what they are going to allow us to do is to look in detail at, um, at, at particular objects on the sky. So just um, as an example, if you're familiar with the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, um, it's actually my personal favorite Hubble image, uh, but it's, it's an image of just 10,000 galaxies. Um, and what you want to do with an image like that is to look in detail at certain galaxies in that field and block out the extra light. So if I wanted to pick out, you know, um, a handful of galaxies in that field, I would need to block out the light, all the background light, the light from maybe nearby galaxies that I didn't want to study, and just focus on light from a particular galaxy. And um, and then uh, the, the uh, micro shutters are going to allow us to do that. So we'll basically, you can close all the shutters and then just open up the few that you need in order to, to pinpoint these galaxies and get spectra from these galaxies. So um, that's, that's just one example um, of, uh, of galaxies. There are other science, um, science themes that come into play with the Webb telescope as well. In terms of the, the the looking at the, the formation of galaxies. Um, I, I know that there are a bunch of animations that the, uh, the, the NASA Visualization Lab has, has put together. Um, and I hope, I wonder if our, um, our engineer Colin, if he can put up the galaxy evolution animation and we can get an idea about the kind of, uh, kind of things that the James Webb Space Telescope might be uh, allowing us to see. We get sure. That. So um, again, one of one of the the main goals. So well, there are kind of four science themes for the James yeah. Webb Space Telescope. Um, the the first thing we want to look at is the first stars and galaxies to form in the early universe. So again, with Hubble, we we've been able to to revolutionize our understanding of the universe. We've we've answered so many questions using Hubble, uh, but. Mm -hmm. With Hubble's size and uh, the fact that it sees mostly in optical light, uh, there's only so much we can see. Again, we kind of push the limits of what Hubble can see. Um, but we are, are missing that first epic of, of um, the creation of, of stars and galaxies, those first stars and galaxies to light up in the very early universe. We can't see right now. So we're missing kind of a, a crucial piece of the puzzle in terms of how galaxies got started 13 billion years ago. So so that's the first science theme, is, is first light. Um, the second science theme, which this animation also shows a little bit, is the assembly of galaxies. So um, we know that, for example, when we look at nearby galaxies, we know our Milky Way is a pretty big galaxy. A lot of um, uh, our, our nearest big neighbor, Andromeda, is um, a fairly big galaxy. It's a big organized spiral galaxy. Um, and a lot of the, the other nearby galaxies that we see um, are big and organized. You know, when you think of a galaxy, you kind of think of, of large spiral arms, lots of beautiful structure. But when we, when we look back at more distant galaxies, so galaxies that existed when the universe was, was younger, uh, we see a much different picture. So distant galaxies are much um, usually smaller, clumpier, kind of train wreck type objects. So this <laughs> is a big kind of uh, question, standing question in astronomy, is how do we go from these tiny clumpy things in the early universe to big large organized structure? And um, so, so the Webb telescope is going to allow us to see those first things, the first things that we can't see yet. Um, it's going to, we're going to be able to see those. So that's the first science theme. Uh, um, and, and, the, and also the second science theme, the assembly of galaxies, how, how the galaxies built up over time. Another important part of that second science theme of the assembly of galaxies um, that goes hand in hand is the assembly of supermassive black holes. So we look at massive galaxies in the, the nearby universe. We know that almost all very large galaxies have very large uh, black holes at their centers. And uh, these so-called supermassive black holes are, have masses up to a billion times the mass of the sun. So they're huge. Um, and, uh, but we think, you know, early on in the universe, obviously, uh, the, the, 
black holes were much smaller. So this is a big question of how we got these huge black holes. And um, of course, one of the thoughts is that um, that process through which this occurs um, is galaxy merging. So we look at um, galaxies uh, with Hubble, and we can see lots of galaxies that are in this process of galaxy mergers. And so this is a really kind of a hot topic in astronomy right now, is, is figuring out how we went from the early universe to the present day universe, this whole right. idea of galaxy assembly. Um, and then the, the third science theme is uh, the birth of stars, which I kind of um, touched on before. So, um, so we're talking, so before we're talking about early on in the universe's history, further back, now we're kind of talking more about inside our own galaxy, inside our Milky Way. So we look at our Milky Way and we see these large pillars of gas and dust and we know that this is where stars are born. Um, but again, we can't see through those dust pillars in optical light and light with Hubble. Um, Hubble does have a little bit of near-infrared capability with this new um, Wide Field Camera 3. And um, with this, this little glimpse that we've gotten of the near-infrared part of the spectrum, we've already been able to see some really cool things. So with uh, near-infrared, you're able to, again, peer through those, those clouds of gas and dust and see the sights of these, these newborn stars, these stellar nurseries where stars are born. So a lot that we don't know about that process, about how stars are born. So that's the third thing that Webb is going to shed a lot of light on. And then the fourth science theme is um, to start to look at exoplanets, which is um, uh, it's outside my field of research, but it's so exciting. And I saw your show um, a few weeks ago uh, about Kepler, and I was, I was yeah. so intrigued by that whole presentation. And this whole field of, of, of exoplanets is, um, you know, it's... It, we're on the, the precipice of possibly some absolutely paradigm shifting discoveries with this telescope. So with Kepler, we've been able to find, uh, you know, a, a good handful of planets, of relatively nearby planets that exist in their habitable zones. And um, we know that they're there. We don't know a whole lot about them yet, but we know that, we're, that they're there. And a lot of the chemical um, signatures of those exoplanets um, occur in the infrared part of the spectrum. And again, this is key to, to um, Webb's, uh, the way we've built Webb, is we want to, to be able to look at the actual atmospheres of these exoplanets. So it's an absolutely, that, that uh, particular science theme, even though it's not my area of research, is um, so exciting to me. I mean, we could be on the verge of a, a, a discovery with this telescope that would absolutely, I mean, what, that's huge, right? The, yeah. the potential to discover, um, Webb will have the sensitivity to detect water signatures in exoplanets if they're there. So it's, um, I mean, it gives me chills just thinking about it. It's so exciting, <laughs> uh, this whole exoplanet science. Yeah, so the, the sensitivity of this, of, of this space telescope is really going to allow it to focus in on some of these exoplanets that Kepler is discovering and really give us a lot more information about how, quote-unquote, Earth-like they really are and how potentially habitable they might be, right? That's right. So, um, again... Uh with, with Kepler, we know that they're there because we see their transits. Uh, but with Webb, with its spectroscopic capabilities, we'll be able to, um, again, get spectra of these atmospheres mm -hmm. and, and see what's there, see what chemicals are in, in, their, um, in their atmospheres. And, and the thing, that's one of the, the cool things about, about this, this telescope is that it's, um, of course, it's an astronomy telescope. And you hear people say, well, it's just an astronomy telescope. Well, it, it, it is an astronomy telescope, and it, um, you know, it will, it, it's going to see a lot of things, kind of nearby things, these exoplanets, and the most distant things that we can even see. So it's a very large part of astronomy. You know, a lot of astronomers are going to be able to use this telescope. But um, this whole idea of discovering, of possible discovery of, um, of, of, of life or of other, you know, um, signatures in these exoplanets, I mean, that's not just an astronomy discovery. That's a human discovery. You know, that, right, that's a discovery right. that will shake um, how we think about the world. How we, th how we think about everything. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, for the... the the questions of um, what it's going to look at and how it's going to look at them. It's just really, the, the James Webb Space Telescope is really going to be great at looking far, far away. Hubble, news came out, it just looked at Pluto, was able to find a, a fourth moon around Pluto. Is, is the Webb Telescope going to be uh, able to look at our own solar system or is it going to mostly be focused outwards? Um, it will, 
it will mostly be focused outwards, but we will be able to look at some of those um, distant solar system objects. So I'm, I'm pretty sure Pluto is fair game. The outer solar system will be okay. Um, closer objects will be too bright um, in the infrared, mm -hmm. so we can't really look at Mars. We obviously can't point, um, you know, towards Venus or anything uh, anything closer because uh, yeah. it has a stake hold. But um, the outer solar system is definitely a, an area of research that we'll be able to, to study a lot more. I think that's going to be really interesting. It'll be... I. I I think it's going to be fascinating to take all the data from these various space telescopes looking at our own solar system and then as we're able to look into other solar systems be able to compare them and see the similar features you know are is our solar system um, a, a solar system that is has developed the way that other solar systems develop is our galaxy developing the same way that other galaxies developed are these very predictable processes right yeah, so all, all along the way, there are all these um, discoveries that are going to, to uh, um, allow us to relate our experience um, on Earth yeah. um, as planet, form forms, uh, planet formation in other solar systems, and like you said, the galaxies as well. And, um, and that's another cool thing about astronomy is it's, um, there's, a, there's a personal connection at a level that you um, might not get in other areas of science. Um, you know, our, our actual bodies are made, um, our planet is made, our bodies, the iron in our blood was made in an exploded star that exploded before the solar system formed. So, you know, we are literally made out of star stuff, which is just, you know, it's, it's such a, a cool kind of visceral connection to astronomy that I, I think is, is really neat. Oh, it's absolutely fabulous. For the, the James Webb Space Telescope, um, is there, you know, a basic you know, take home message that you'd love people to understand about the telescope and why it is important to science? Well, I guess I would say, you know, everybody loves Hubble. Um, it's produced all these beautiful images and, and it really has rewritten the textbooks. We've discovered things from Hubble that um, have, has, it's just completely changed how we view the universe. And uh, there's no doubt in my mind, that the Webb Telescope will do that same thing. It will revolutionize astronomy all over again. And so um, that, that idea that we're standing at the precipice of discovery in astronomy, of all these huge questions, that we, we, we're on the verge, we can almost answer them, but not quite but we're going to be able to answer them with Webb. And so I think it's going to bring about um, a new revolution in astronomy, some, again, possible paradigm-shifting discoveries. Um, and another thing that I, I like to point out to people is that, you know, these space telescopes, these things that, um, you know, may seem unconnected, you know, it's, it's your telescope, right? If you're an American taxpayer, or in the, in the case of, um, of the Webb Telescope, Webb is also has components from Europe and from Canada. Um, if you're a taxpayer, um, this is your telescope too. And in, in a very real sense, um, we're able, all the, the images from Hubble, for example, are freely available for anyone to go get. The raw data is available for anyone to go get and play with. So it's kind of open source in that sense. And yeah. um, it's, um, it's our telescope. You know, we built it as a nation and as a world international collaborations. And so um, it's, it's, you know, it's connected to us in that way. What happens to the telescope and all of the, uh, the, the discoveries and the expectations for it if the funding is, is cut? Well, obviously, you know, we, we're hoping that that won't happen. Um, but no. we, again, we, we designed this telescope uh, with these basic or these these uh, frontier science questions in in mind, and um, we uh, have designed the telescope to answer these questions, and yeah. those questions won't be answered um, if the web doesn't fly. Uh, we have to have web to answer these big questions, and there's no other telescope that's um, being built or even in conception that can um, answer these big science questions. And so it really is, um, you know, it's, it's the Hubble of the next generation, and it's absolutely a, a frontier machine as far as um, science discovery goes in astronomy. Absolutely. Are you, are you looking forward to, to being able to get data from the James Webb Telescope? I mean, you're, getting, you're looking at data from uh, the Wide Field 3 camera now. You're analyzing things and um, 
you know, how, how, can, how do you think you're going to feel? Say that funding continues, the, the web flies, and you start collecting data. What is that going to mean to you as a scientist? Well, I think um, all astronomers who are, um, you know, cheering for this telescope to fly are, are you know, are, are waiting for it, right? We're doing all right. we can with what we have, and we're making awesome new discoveries with Hubble literally every day. So there have been um, almost 10,000 papers published with data from Hubble. That's over a paper a day for the last 21 years. So the discovery, the actual discovery um, is, is huge with, with telescopes like this. And that's going to continue um, with the Webb telescope. And um, uh, for me personally, I study how, how stars form and galaxies that existed um, early on in the universe and and again this complete new capability we're going to have to be able to study the infrared properties of these galaxies in great detail detail that we can't even touch right now um, is amazing and one of the, the the coolest things about science is you know we have all these nice little sets of questions that we've developed um, and that we want to answer and that's great we'll answer those we're excited about answering those but every time we launch a bold new telescope like this we answer questions that we didn't even know we were going to have. So we have these surprise discoveries. There's all these mysteries out there waiting to be discovered that we have no idea about. That happened with Hubble. I'm sure that will happen with Webb. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point that we can't we we can make ex expectations and predictions uh, for, you know, what we're building, but there's so much that you can't actually predict. There's so, like you, like you said, there's so many questions that come up in the process of discovery. You learn one thing and something else, it, it raises another question that you never even thought of before. So, I don't know, it seems like the James Webb Space Telescope is going to bring us a world of discovery and of new questions that will lead to the next big project. Absolutely. And that's one of the exciting things about science is how it, it builds on itself and all these new discoveries. And also there's the, the, um, the, the part of inspiration, of inspiring kids. You know, I was inspired as a kid by my beautiful dark sky in, in rural Arkansas, but, but also in seeing the shuttle launches and, and seeing the Hubble images, you know, when I was in junior high and high school. And, and um, NASA has a huge role in, 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 in inspiring this next generation of explorers. And, and I actually, I gave a talk um, earlier this week to a group of seventh and eighth grade girls about the James Webb Space Telescope. And, and you know, I told them, this is your telescope. Uh, yeah. This is going to be operating when you're in college and when you're getting to grad school and um, it's, it's, it's exciting because it really is you know I'm, I'm, I'm so excited about seeing the data myself as an astronomer um, but our, our, the kids that are coming up through high school now this is their telescope and that's that's really great I just got goosebumps seriously <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking to myself you know you tell seventh eighth graders now if you're interested in space if you're interested in the in answering or asking these big questions you could work with this telescope when when you get to grad school I mean there's a it's a goal for students to actually reach for that's um, that's something big that's really big um, we're getting towards the end of the hour here. I wanted to know if there are any, uh, this is a question that somebody um, sent to me on Google Plus, if there are any long shot goals scientifically. You have your four main themes for the science of the James Webb Space Telescope. Is there anything that you just kind of hope that scientists, you know, are kind of like, well, this isn't what we wrote down, but we're kind of hoping that it might achieve this kind of, this long shot, but it's not, you know, not expected. Well, um, the, the, the discovery of, of life, um, of, of extrasolar intelligent life would all obviously be um, a huge discovery. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I don't know that we're expecting that. Again, we'll be able to see the, the chemistry of the planets, but um, I mean, that's, that's kind of a long shot, um, a long shot goal. Um, also studying uh, dark energy. So most of the universe is actually stuff that we don't know much about at all. Uh, so that's another, and that was actually a discovery, almost an accidental discovery by Hubble. Uh, so that's that's another field that, that will be interesting to study with, with the Webb telescope. Fantastic. Now, um, I'm sure people are making up their own minds about um, how they feel about their telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope. And um, 
you know, what they want to tell their congressmen, Congress members um, about how to vote on the appropriations bill. But there is this fantastic video that I think kind of mirrors my opinion, you know, not that I'm going to bias you all or anything, but I wanted to play part of this video uh, that was put together by, uh, I think, Hank of the Vlog Brothers. If I don't know if you all have seen it, but he did this wonderful video about the top five awesome, most awesome things about the James Webb Space Telescope. And I'm not going to play his top five things because Amber has already brought up many of those, but this is his reasoning for why the James Webb Space Telescope needs to be uh, needs to needs to be funded and needs to go on and do great science. But by way of a longer and second introduction to this topic, I introduction to this topic, I have a thing to say. I personally believe that there are two ways to make the world a better place. You can decrease the suck and you can increase the awesome. Now these are not mutually exclusive things. That's hard to say. Mutually exclusive. But they're also and so that was Hank from the Vlog Brothers, otherwise known as the Nerd Fighters, giving his reasoning as to um, why we should increase awesome. And the James Webb Space Telescope is a big part of increasing awesome, along with all of his hand gestures. That about does it for our show today. I would love to thank Dr. Amber Strawn for joining me here on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and all the wonderful information that you brought. Thank you. And for anyone out there who is interested in get, find, finding out more information, digging a little deeper into this subject, you can go to jwst.nasa.gov for more information. And um, I'm not, I, I do believe that the James Webb Space Telescope also has a Twitter account and a Facebook account and a Flickr account. And I don't know, I don't think it's got a Google Plus account. I don't think it has that yet. But you can't have it all. So if you would like to connect with the James Webb Space Telescope, there are, multi there are a multitude of ways to do that. And... Um, Amber is one of the wonderful people from NASA who is working on the telescope, will be working on the science, on, on doing the science that the telescope will allow and um, on helping us understand a little bit more about this great vision for the future. I'm Dr. Kiki and this has been the Dr. Kiki Science Hour. That's about it. That does it for our hour. Next week, we're going to be talking about the world of viruses with Dr. Vincent Racaniello from uh, This Week in Virology. He's the host of This Week in Virology. I'd bring him, on, bring him on over for his visit. And we're also going to be in the new studio. Yay! New studio. I will be there in person with better lighting. It's going to be amazing. I'm going to really appreciate it. And uh, until then... You can follow my sciencey pursuits on Twitter, Google Plus, okay. Facebook, oh. all sorts of places, and uh, you can also subscribe to Dr. Kiki Science Hour in iTunes. If you can find past episodes at twit.tv forward slash Kiki K I K I, and if you need more sciencey goodness, there's always Google. I will see you next week. Thanks for tuning in to my Science Hour, and remember, all I ask is just one hour a week, and I do hope that this hour made your world a whole lot more interesting. Thanks a lot. <laughs>